Hi Arun, how are you? Hey, Dr. Sanjeev, it's a pleasure to meet you today. Thank you for having me here. Pleasure is mine as well. And thank you all who are joining from all over the world, listening to us. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Sanjeev. Uh, been in the uh, human resource function for last uh, 25 years, uh, leading various multinational companies. And I love to be called Ideapreneur because I believe that idea brings new initiatives to life. And I think that brings a lot of impact, not only to the people as well as to the organization. I have recently authored a book titled Plan C, uh, which basically talks about the journey of uh, culture transformation the leader can achieve by making their organization totally risk-free and making it, uh, you can say it's success driven. So that book is very well received and uh, proud to be part of uh, DLC Fire Chat today with Arun. Actually, I must say, Dr. Sanjeev, the pleasure is all mine to have a veteran like you. I'm a decade behind you in terms of experience, been in the HR space as well. And I'm really inspired to see your journey as an HR professional, straddling through different industries. Pharma in particular is something that's very close to my heart. I'm in the device diagnostics industry now. So I'm really glad to be sharing this space with you, Dr. Sanjeev. And I look forward to learning from your insights. So hello, everyone from uh, different parts of the world. My name is Arun, uh, Arun Kaimal. I'm part of the HR team of a U.S. multinational company and been in the HR space for about 15 years, worked with companies like GE, Nokia, Deutsche Bank, and now Dana Corporation. So uh, lived and worked in uh, Middle East and Africa, India, and now in Asia Pacific or Singapore for the last five and a half years. Uh, in my spare time, I love mentoring, coaching, and teaching. That's what I'm really passionate about. So that's a bit about me and excited to be here. Thanks uh, DLC for giving us this platform, for getting us professionals from different parts of the world together and creating so much content that can add value to the fraternity. So happy to be a small contributor in that journey along with Dr. Sanjeev. So look forward to this discussion. Uh, absolutely. I think wonderful uh, background, uh, Arun. And I think a uh, lot of common things in terms of our interest. So looking forward for this very value-adding uh, five chat session organized by DLC. You know, the topic for today that we've chosen is the culture-focused strategy. And, you know, the culture-focused strategy for creating a risk-free, sustainable growth and success. Now, many years back as a student of HR, I remember reading Peter Drucker, where, you know, he said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And after that, I've heard many other leaders talking about culture and how it has a very important role on strategy. In textbooks, though, we always learn that strategy comes first. Strategy that sets the tone for culture. Would you mind sharing with me and the audience? How do you see the two interplaying and how does it you know, really play into the future in creating sustainable organizations? Oh, wonderful question, Arun, to begin with. I just took it from where Peter Ducker kind of ended uh, about uh, culture, its strategy over breakfast. Yeah. I would say that culture, its strategy over all three meals. And this these meals are being served by none other than the chief executive officers and CXOs. That's the most interesting part of uh, the way culture has been dealt with. I think it's a buzzword. Uh, it's been spoken in the boardrooms, it has been spoken in the global symposiums, seminars. But I think uh, in most of our discussions, and even you would also appreciate, a culture has never taken a center stage. Uh, in terms of the way we drill down the, for example, strategy, I think the last entire century around has been uh, spent in creating wonderful strategies I think a lot of, you can say, uh, cottage industry came out of this entire, uh, what you call, developing strategy for the organization for growth and success. Yeah. Okay. And um, what we have gained out of that is a very, uh, I will say, inconsistent uh, and, and, and the kind of organization which has not thrived the uh, various challenges of time. And I think that the, the case in point is the, the kind of turbulence a uh, pandemic like COVID has created. Absolutely. Had we had a superb strategy, had we had a great execution, I think we could have survived this pandemic for last three years very effectively and very successfully. But it didn't happen. So what went wrong? 
I think the, the thing which somewhere got missed is, did we created a ecosystem? Did we created a kind of a, a, a emotional connect? Yeah. Did we role model something which uh, acted as a glue with all the team members, all the people within the enterprise, or the nation, or the organization, or a small entity like a startup, where everyone got driven by that particular, I will say, uh, the the role modeling of the values, which is the leader or the the, the head of the enterprise was exhibiting or demonstrating. So, so the point I'm trying to make is there are two type of, uh, I will say, uh, orientation. Mm -hmm. I call it uh, plan A, plan B, and I will uh, categorize them very, uh, very, very uh, candidly as managership, not leadership. Because they, they, this all approach are for managing the, what you call issue in hand. For example, plan A is all about action. A stands for action. Mm -hmm. Wherein the, the, the manager orientation is, or when I say manager, I include CEOs there. It's not about the title or the position. I'm talking about CEOs here who believe that if we have a fantastic strategy and we execute to the core, we will achieve a phenomenal, consistent, sustainable, or profitable results. And the another managership is the plan B, which basically talk about the backup. Let's have a great risk management strategy, risk management plan. And if we have that plan B, if plan A fails, then we will in, in, immediately implement the plan B. The results is again very, as I said, uh, inconsistent. So what I'm, what I'm hearing you say is plan A is all about action. Plan B is about backup. But what you are, you know, then kind of leading us to is plan C, which probably is the secret sauce. Because in a situation like, for example, what happened in the last couple of years, nobody could predict, you know, the best strategy consultants could never say, there's, there's a, you know, pandemic going to happen in 2020. And this is how the world is going to change. Everybody was experiencing it, experiencing it as it was evolving. And nobody could really give a clear prediction of when it starts, how it ends, what impact it creates. So what I'm hearing you is a much more deeper thought to say that, look, no matter what the storm, I'm going to train my crew in a way that they are prepared to navigate any storm Absolutely. and reach that ship, you know, take that ship forward. Absolutely. Absolutely I think right. it's a great idea, uh, Dr. Sanjeev, and one company that comes to mind, which kind of, you know, if I look at the share price as well, it's pointing towards that, is Microsoft. If you look at Satya Nadella and how he's brought empathy into this whole, you know, scheme of leadership, and now I'm calling it leadership, not managership, because I can see the difference after you, you know, kind of highlighted it. But is that is that how you're also looking at this, Dr. Sanjeev? What are your thoughts? Wonderful, Arun. I think you've connected all the... Uh... Uh, you can say point us very well. Uh, I think the point I'm trying to make is, and I'm leading towards that is, the leadership of having the culture as the one of the most important, I will say strategy. Culture as one of the most important strategy to create an organization or an enterprise or a nation, which is going to face any kind of volatility, any kind of complexity, any kind of uncertainty, any kind of, uh, I will say, uh, a pandemic or an epidemic kind of a situation like what we faced in the last three years. And that is what I call uh, Plan C. And that is what I call leadership. And I, I think you rightly pointed out uh, the difference between the Microsoft under Satya Nadella and Microsoft under Steve Barmer. Yeah. If you if you look at their style, if you look at their personality, the 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 Steve Bomber, I will not like to say managership, but I think he was a very plan A driven guy. He created a lot of uh, you can say plan in terms of how to identify products for Microsoft, and but then did he uh, created a as I said a value system like as you rightly pointed out empathy which Satya Nada, uh, Nadella quoted in his book, uh, uh, Hit Refresh. Yeah. Very, very well, well put, which he learned from his family and none other than uh, any any Ivy College. Uh, and I think he put that empathy in letter and spirit, and that's very critical, letter and spirit in his organization, where he said that I don't want silos. 
I don't want competition within within the uh, what you call product teams within Microsoft. Yeah. I want to create an organization which create value through values, and I think that's the that's the key point. I haven't come across organization where in the boardroom people talk about culture vision, people talk about culture mission, people talk about KPIs around culture, mm. people talk about culture reviews. People talk about culture interventions. We have vision, we have mission, uh, we have uh, talking about top line. And I, if I ask you what is top line, you will very uh, comfortably say that, oh, it is all about uh, the, the revenue, the, the market share, the growth numbers. If I ask you bottom line, oh, you will say this is a very, very fundamental layman uh, question you were asking Sanjeev in the morning. The bottom line is all about profitability, profit before tax, profit after tax. What is the middle line? You know top line. We you know bottom line. What is the middle line? Can you can you can you respond on this? No, absolutely. And Dr. Sanjeev, I was I was you know in my preparation for this discussion reading about ITC and how under Mr. Y C Deveshwar they spoke about the triple bottom line, and somewhere you know like the people, planet, profit in that order, it, it made a lot of sense to me because. A lot of times, like you said, no people start with the top line, the bottom line, and they end with that. But like what you said, what are the other parts of the ecosystem that need to be served? If we start asking that question, and the middle line, which is not really, in my view, it could be the other stakeholders that are benefiting from this enterprise. And if you really shift that, if you shift that mindset from saying, "Hey, I'm selling cigarettes," to saying, "I'm into eat chopper," you know, going into rural villages and connecting people from the hinterlands with the growth and the prosperity and bringing in new products that are really helping <clears throat> helping serve people's needs. Maybe, you know, it's books for students, it's hotels for people who don't want to be with their family or it's food, healthy, wholesome food for parents who want to you know, give nutrition to their kids. So the transition for ITC has been uh, something that, you know, came in, in my research for this discussion. And to your question, the middle line in my mind is everybody else in the ecosystem that we need to think about. It cannot be just... You know, profit, it has to go beyond. And in, in what ITC is articulating, you know, they probably called it as people, planet, profit. To, to me, that seems to be one part of the answer. But I would be keen to hear from you on how do you see it? Oh, absolutely. So this is my, as I said, 25 years of corporate life and interacting with global leaders and even talking in various global uh, symposium. Uh, I think people fumbled on this particular uh, term called middle line. When I ask the people sitting in the audience who are mostly CEOs, CXOs and global leaders, they, they fumble, they, they refer it to either middle management, they refer it to a uh, lot of other things. I think simply put, the middle line of any enterprise, nation and any unit you take it is the, the core value, the non-negotiable values which you keep it very close to yourself and with basically guide your, uh, you can say behavior and in, in a larger sense that create the culture. Oh, so, so Why that's the middle line. So if I have to define culture in a very, very simple layman language, uh, Arun, and for everyone there, I think there are a lot of interpretation, a lot of uh, definitions out there. My definition of culture is culture is the behavior or the key behavior role model by the most influential people in the enterprise. And who are those most influential people in the enterprise? Most of the time, the leader, CEOs, CXOs. In a nation, it is your the premier, the president, and, and, and the, the head of the state. In a family, it is the father and the mother. Any, any influential person demonstrating a, a behavior become the value or the principle of the people who are following it. And that constitute the middle line. And if your middle line is healthy, rest assured, your top line and your bottom line is sustainable. But the point here is how we are drilling down it to the part of our day-to-day -day working, how we are drilling down to our, as I said, execution of each and every plan and strategy which we are undertaking how it is becoming part of our vision, how it is becoming part of our mission, how it is becoming part of my business reviews. 
uh, am I reviewing how we are doing on values? What is the kind of feedback or inputs which is coming from the uh, organization and employees and the stakeholder in terms of the way we are performing on our values, not on only on our, on our uh, quarterly numbers and annual numbers, which is again driven by top line and bottom line consciousness. And if you take any example, Arun, big organization with phenomenal top line and bottom line vanishes from the scene just because they negotiated on something called middle line, which, is, which are the values. Take the case of Satyam. Take the case of Enron, take the case of Lehman Brothers, take the case of Worldcom, take the case of any XYZ company which is vanishing from the scene. And I think COVID has given a reality check, phenomenal reality check to all the so-called Ivy League, uh, you can say CEOs and CXOs, even the greatest uh, leaders of the nations, they, 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 they absolutely got exposed absolutely got exposed in terms of handling this pandemic because they were not ready because they were only focusing on how we can as i said earn those short-term gains short-term benefits short-term whatever uh, earning whatever yeah, gains but i think they never believed in as i said role modeling the kind of as i said the, the basic disposition behavior which will generate a lot of inspiration and enthusiasm among the people who are following. So there is a significant power which is which is there within this very simple but very profound thing called role modeling of values. And I have uh, in my PhD research, which I did, uh, my thesis was uh, the linkage between the role modeling of values by the leader on the employee engagement further on the business performance. So statistically, it is proven now, mathematically it is proven, empirically it is proven that if the leaders of the enterprise or the nation or the organization, they demonstrate the values in letter and spirit consistently, then the employee who are, or the, the people who are following them, they will get inspired. Because they get inspired, their discretionary performance enhance. And because their discretionary performance enhance, so that is the capability of the human capital, that they have a discretionary performance. Yeah. One is the performance which you give for the salary. The other is you go beyond the brief. You go above and beyond the, as I said, uh, the what has been uh, told to you. And your discretionary performance. And because of this discretionary performance increasing, your business numbers your revenues, your market share, your, is bound to get impacted positively, correspondingly, proportionally. But what happens is in the entire, you can say, muddle of uh, the becoming competitive, racing against race, uh, we, we take an easy easy route. Ultimately, ultimately, the travesty is we have lost billions of dollars and trillions of dollars in being just being plan A and plan B. And if you see the organization which has created value over the years, you take Tata's as an example from India, you, you've taken a very good example of Microsoft. You, you take other, there are great examples. There are great nations who are moving from a GDP approach to a human happiness index approach. Yeah, case in point is Bhutan, case in point is uh, there are other Finland, other uh, countries which are moving from this GDP orientation. So there is a shift which is happening, but it's happening very, very, very gradually. So oh, great, very, really well said, uh, Dr. Sanjeev. I think the case for values as the you know foundational starting point for a great growth journey, and then eventually a sustainability journey because growth and sustainability happen in spurs. You kind of you know grow, then you sustain, grow, sustain, grow, sustain. So that, that case seems to have been established very strongly. How sure. do you decide on the right values? Because there are organizations that, that espouse values, which are clearly not in line with, you know, good for the nation. So in this corporate world and, you know, in a world where things are so uh, self-serving in, in most uh, aspects, how do you really fix your compass on the right values? How do you pick those right values that one can really, you know, like you said, everybody embraces it from the top to the bottom, 
leaders live it middle level managers you know it embrace it and then translate it for the team and everybody lives that values but how do you decide what are the right values for a company no so this is a very very profound question and very important question in my view so the first thing first is the values needs to have a larger purpose of benefiting the you can say not only the enterprise right but the society at large okay the stakeholder at large yeah so take some universal value to begin with and i think there could be lot of deliberation and i think most of the organization i believe and i have also worked in those organization or enterprise they do lot of brainstorming they engages people they have a kind of a very deep dive exercise of identifying what are those core behaviors or the principles which are non negotiable which is going to not only impact the organization but also as i said the stakeholder at large in a in a positive sense so for example uh, the universal uh, values integrity right now integrity is uh, uh, what you call universally what you call applied uh, a principle or a value nobody yeah. will debate on this piece that okay uh, i don't think integrity is good for my enterprise or my nation or my uh, my entity or my startup the values like um, innovation creativity teamwork collaboration excellence entrepreneurship yeah and and as i said it has to be linked to the the ethos of the organization or the enterprise or the nation ultimately as i said the the core you can say compass of identifying the right set of values are which is going to create a sustainable organization or enterprise which is going to live beyond the the as i said the the promoters or the Or, or what do you call uh, what do you call the 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 startup partners of the organization or even the leaders who have created those nations it should live beyond them and I, and and i think that's where the entire discussion or the conversation or the narrative in the enterprise should happen that okay and values are not a casting stone these are also like a flowing water right and it has to be have a relevancy it has to have a context yeah absolutely like post covid there are a lot of you can say change in the way the organization is operating so yeah. how the teamwork and collaboration is relevant in a hybrid environment is the point of discussion today right absolutely. how you can create a high touch in a high tech environment is the point of discussion today because we are in a high tech environment suddenly the entire digitization has got advanced 10 years Uh, uh before then it could have uh, achieved uh, if the covid would not have happened we would not have seen uh, all these interaction which we are having today over zoom and various other technology so there are a lot of positives which has come in terms of the context building but the point i am trying to make in a very very simple manner arun is what are some of my non negotiable principles and that is becoming as i said the credo of the uh, enterprise of the organization of the nation take the, india is one of the biggest example that this civilization has thrived and survived so many turbulence but i think the ethos of the nation was to be very inclusive and diversified absolutely unity and diversity ha absolutely unity and diversity it's a globe the, the entire globe is a one family yeah, so so that's that is ethos It 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 has not come from some kind of a, as I said Ivy League uh, syllabus. It has come from within. Middle line is within. It will say, "You get a legacy, make it better, and leave a better legacy." Absolutely. You're driven by that kind of a, a vision. You get driven driven by that kind of aspiration. It's 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 a very powerful thing. What I take back is one is you know your values need to be universal. The world is one family, and if you really look at making the world a better place. then answering that question and you know kind of trying to fix your compass in that direction to say what can i do to contribute to make this world a better place that could possibly you know help you so things that like you said you no know, brotherhood or teamwork and uh, you know making it sustainable 
the orientation also goes much longer, right? Because otherwise today, a lot of companies are looking at quarter to quarter end of survival rates because CEO right. compensation is sometimes linked there. And you are seeing that shift. If you look at many corporations now, the whole shift or the whole uh, force to say ESG is sometimes really critical. How can we put ESG into the KRAs of senior leaders? Yes. So it's what you do today and the money that you make. But the impact that you create over time for a varied set of stakeholders, especially for the world, making that world a better place. I'm encouraged to see what's happening there. And I do believe that somewhere it's going in the right direction. Maybe the pace could be accelerated, but the direction seems to be certainly encouraging. Let me take you into another direction, uh, uh, Dr. Sanjeev, because I know I'm mindful of time as well. And I want to get sure. as much value as I can from you for the audience through this sure. discussion. We've discussed, you know, about values. We've, we've discussed, you know, about how do we fix the compass, the middle line. Can you share with us a situation where when you see this not happening or a situation where, you know, you face a dilemma where things are going against these values and everybody around, you know, is kind of closing a blind eye or choosing to have a blind eye towards this. How do you respond in today's world? Because uh, it's a difficult world out there. You know, opportunities possibly uh, don't come as often. And if you are in a good role, in a senior position, everybody on the ship sees to, seems to be taking that easy way out. Have you faced a situation like this? If you have, or even if you've not, what advice would you have for people to kind of you know, stay on that path and not give away or give up on values? I think a very valid, uh, I think, uh, pointer you have raised, uh, Arun. And, and I, as I said, and as you would have also experienced in your journey of life, and not only the corporate life, uh, this is not an ideal world. It's not an ideal situation, right? Uh, and there's always that conflict which keeps happening, uh, as as a, as a, uh, as a either the uh, as an employee or as a manager or as a leader or even as a, a citizen. That your your principle and your value system, which you've imbibed through your family, your parents, is getting in conflict with. The, the the way uh, world world operates and the same happens in the organization. Organization is not uh, is in vacuum. It is also part of the extended part of the same society and the same global scenario. So there would be, I will say, uh, conflicts, and there have been conflicts. There would be situation where uh, there, there, there is a misalignment. There would be situation where the 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 leader has a very different way to look at. Yeah how they, he wants to kind of build the organization. And I think uh, values, culture, behavior is something which is I've seen is not very well received by the uh, the board and, and, and the CEOs and the CXOs because they don't understand this lingo. I think, I think that's where the role of the CHRO or the people who are the kind of a facilitator of this particular thing is how we try to link it with the, 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 the deliverables of the organization or the enterprise or the nation. Link it with that. Yeah. Not make it esoteric. Not make it very high pedestal, high moral ground kind of a uh, thing. Because yeah. that, that will only make people defensive and conscious. So my approach has always been how I convert these things not as a very professorial discussion but convert them into the top line and bottom line. For example, if I have to grow my revenue, what, what are those values which will help us to achieve that? And if, I, if we have decided as a collective uh, leadership that, okay, fine, uh, excellence could be the one the, uh, value we, we're going to practice. So let's, let's define excellence. What excellence means? Excellence could have 200 interpretation. So, and I'm giving an example of my current yeah. organization as well, and even my past organization. And after a lot of deliberation, we arrived at two specific things which will make excellence yeah. uh, as most visible, measurable thing. We said that any growth achieved through speed and accuracy is excellence. So speed and accuracy become the two pillar of excellence. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And speed is measurable, accuracy is also measurable. It's tangible. And it has got an impact on top line and bottom line. Because if you're delivering before you, what you have committed, if you're delivering first time right, if you're delivering more than what you have committed, obviously you are impacting your revenue, obviously you're impacting your profitability, obviously you're uh, uh, what you call impacting your EBITDA. Now yeah. you have to drill down these speed and accuracy 
as a measurable uh, performance KPIs in each and every person from top to bottom. Yeah. While you will achieving your target, which is what part, the how part is I will measure the way you go to achieve this with speed and accuracy. I, I remember somebody saying this, that never before has the rate of change been so fast and never ever will it be slower again. So it's just going to increase, you know, in, in times to come. So very well said there, uh, Dr. Sanjeev, some great insights coming in. We looked at the macro picture, tried to understand, you know, the, the triple bottom line, how culture values play a very important role, the middle part, you know, like you rightly said, and then how that leads us to creating a sustainable organization, which is the foundation for growth and success. So if you chase growth and success without having the values right, then you might win. You might win the sprint, but you'll never win the marathon. And then you get some great examples of leaders, um, organizations like Tata Group. I was fortunate to study in an institution supported by Tata. And I really look back and say, this is one enterprise that will stand the test of times. A salt to software conglomerate that you know has created so much value for everybody around. And every time they faced a challenge, be it you know, the, nine, the, the attacks that happened in Mumbai, their enterprises just become stronger, their contributions have become better, and the value that they've created, even with the recent acquisition of, uh, of the airlines in India, there's so much hope and there's so much faith that people have reposed in them. If it was any other company, I'm not sure if people would have had that you know, excitement. But coming home to Tata as you know, Air India, there's generally a belief that they are going to turn this around. I know it's not a very healthy financial you know, uh, position that they've inherited. But still, there's that hope that they, this company can do it. Or if there's any company that can do it, it is this company that can do it. And if I ask the question, why? Then maybe it goes back to the Tata values, you know, the, the century plus years of service that they've you know, given Absolutely. to them. Absolutely. So great. I think we hit some really high points here. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev, I've, I have personally drawn a lot from this discussion. I've gleaned a lot of wisdom from your experiences over two and a half decades. And obviously, I'm looking forward to the book that you've written. And I'm sure you will allow, because I think we're coming up on time, but I'm sure you will allow for our audience to you know, reach out to you via LinkedIn. I'm going to send you an invite for sure and uh, be connected to you. Uh, just with the you know, intent of helping DLC members, other community members to benefit from experiences of each other. I think Jimmy's vision you know, of creating this community where we can take people along, share knowledge, is also anchored in that core value of serving that community, being good you know, for society. I think it has been a phenomenal, uh, I will say, sharing and uh, kind of uh, a very heart-to-heart uh, -heart discussion with you, very free-flowing discussion with you, because a person like you who has uh, seen the life from a very different perspective, I think this, this is like more of a, uh, I will say, merger of perspectives. And uh, this only, again, as I said, uh, create the uh, the value of uh, diversity and inclusion uh, and i think as I, as i was mentioning with you uh, always available for any kind of support to the dlc member or any person within the fraternity uh, in in any which way whatever little knowledge i have or pearls of uh, wisdom i have acquired out of again as i said journey of uh, i will say uh, very hands on experience I would always love to do that and I will continue to do that because as I said, that's my middle line of uh, giving back to the fraternity and uh, leave a better legacy than what I got. Excellent. Excellent. No, I think very well said. I read this somewhere you know, that uh, our, our duty towards future generations is to give them something better than what we inherited when we came into this world. So uh, very positive words, uh, Dr. Sanjeev. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to end on a little bit of a fun note now. Sure. I'm going to ask some rapid fire questions. So, sure. if you were to choose between planet and profit, what would it be? Planet. Planet sure. or people? People. If if you are looking out for you know a, a person to join your team, what would be the one thing that you would say is the most important aspect? That, passion. That, that, passion. Passion. Great. Yeah. One leader who comes top of your mind when you think of you know uh, the middle the middle line becoming very stronger. A great example of somebody who's practiced middle line well. I Who think Mahatma be? Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi ji, okay. Yes, always inspired by him. Beside Excellent. my father. Excellent. He was a great middle line person. One word that you hope people remember you as. 
you know, like the legacy that you want to leave behind. What is that one word that people, should, people that should come to people's mind when they remember Sanjeev Dixit? Idea. Idea. Okay, idea pruner. Idea pruner. Absolutely, idea. So I want to your big shout out to DLC team for getting us together today. So I end with a note of gratitude to you, Dr. Sanjeev, to the DLC team, and to all participants who chose to invest their time to to look into this uh, video today, the fireside chat. Thank you so much, DLC, for uh, giving this opportunity and this platform for sharing. I think uh, more power to DLC and Jimmy and his vision that uh, we able to kind of had a very meaningful, purposeful, uh, and valueful uh, discussion on uh, a very profound subject, very important and topical subject of how we can create a culture focused strategy for a sustainable, risk free. Uh, uh, growth-driven enterprise, and I think uh, uh, the 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 the, uh, the end note from my side is that uh, values enhance is uh, value. So I think I think that's the way uh, one should look at it. And uh, wishing everyone a very safe and healthy time ahead. And uh, thanks uh, DLC again for uh, having Arun and me for this uh, pie chat uh, session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All the best. My top three takeaways of uh, of this session today: one, at an organization level, we need to fix the compass really right. If we are able to look at uh, the values of the organization as senior leaders, if they can start role modeling the values, then it really sets the tone right at the top. So, at an org level, I would say fixing the right values number one, and then leaders, uh, you know, like emulating it across the organization for people to then follow suit is very, very critical. At a team level, it's more about what I can give versus what I can get. And at an individual level, what I learn is all about ideas. So those are my three learnings for today. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sanjay, for these insightful um, discussions and inputs. Very, very grateful to, to you and your time. Thank you.